describing it to someone who doesn't know the sport. Um, So, cyclocross to the layman, it's, it still gets described as cross-country running with a bike, I think. That's quite an easy analogy, even though it's probably not accurate. I guess a cross between cross-country mountain biking and road racing, but with, to my mind, three times as much fun and um, three times as much enjoyment. So it's, it's more about bike racing, mass start, everyone starts together on a circuit that's majority of it is off-road. Um, an off-road <laughs> circuit is actually quite hard to describe, isn't it? It differs to mountain biking in as much as it's traditionally something that can be ridden on a, a road-style bike, not a mountain bike. And so it's a lot faster, it's smoother surfaces and there's more artificial obstacles put in the way to force riders to dismount, so hurdles or stairs <coughs> or short steep climbs that aren't rideable on a lap that traditionally takes between six and seven minutes, so it's around two and a half kilometres a lap. And depending on the category, you race for between 40 minutes and an hour. That hour-ish of racing is pure concentration from start to finish. There's never, ever a dull moment. Um, if you switch off, the chances are you'll be on your backside on the ground in the mud before you know it. Um, and that's what, uh, that's what makes it enjoyable for me. Cyclocross started for me when I was young, um, but cyclocross was, was what we did as mountain bikers uh, to stay fit for mountain biking. Pretty much friends of mine talked me into doing it when I was uh, in college. I just got hooked because it was, it was so much fun. Cyclocross and I sat on watch. Just riding bikes in mud off-road was, was what I wanted to do. First time I did it, I was 14 years old, it was in a muddy field in Wiltshire, literally around the edge of a ploughed field. It was absolutely disgusting. None of us had cross bikes, we were just all on our ordinary road bikes, and we were totally jammed up with mud. Every lap it went through a stream, which started off manageable, but each lap you went through it, the water got deeper and deeper and deeper, until I was pretty tiny at the time, until basically it was sort of coming up to my waist. And then my shoe came off, in the bottom of the stream, and I almost drowned trying to retrieve it. Um, so that's my introduction to cross. Did it get fun? What was the best bit? Um, when, when I finished. Cycle cross is the most fun. You can go out to a race, spectate, have a beer, do a race, go home, not burn your whole day or your whole year training every single day inside and out. It's really, it is a beautiful sport. Why are people so into collecting matchboxes? It's fascinating. It's a, it is a bit of a religion to quite a few people, you know, and it's, 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 it's an intangible why people fall for it and why they really like it. And I think from a fan point of view, it's something that you can get really close to the action.
All kids love playing in the mud. Cyclocross is an extremely inclusive discipline that's uh, very accessible to young people and people without um, huge finances at their disposal. Um, a lot of people come into the sport very young um, and are brought into it with, with cycling parents because of its relatively safe nature. You know, you're riding, you're riding off-road, so you're not crashing onto hard tarmac and, and you're in a, a confined area so parents don't have to worry so much about you running off and the safety of the vehicles. It, it's really popular all around the world and there's a lot of bike riders that have come in and have gone on to other disciplines. Examples of it, Zednik Stybar and Lars Boom, Peter Sagan and, and others that, that have excelled, that have been cross riders when they've, you know, when they've started and they've done really well in cyclocross. Friends of mine talked me into doing it when I was uh, in college. Um, I was reluctant to try it because I didn't want to run with my bike, but um, I got talked into doing it one night, drinking at the bar, and I loved it. I fell in love with it from that first day. Turn off. If you turn off your mind, you crash, or you get overtaken by four or five people. And not to put down road racing, if you're in a bunch, you can just actually ride around and have to be very aware of what you're doing, but you sometimes aren't connected to what's going on. Whereas, of course, when you're riding cross, it is that kind of connection. You can feel every bump. You have the relief when you get to an easy bit, or the terror when you get to a bit that you kind of taken umbrage at which always seems to unseat and then you and then you're successful you kind of master a section and you're so pleased <laughs> you know it doesn't matter whether you came fast or first you conquered some rut that was knocking you off every lap and it's that kind of connection with the course and the people around you I'm Julie Lockhart and I'm uh, Masters World Champion Cyclocross 2012 and I am um, absolutely in love with cyclocross. Julie yep. Lockhart. 73 years old. Yes, it, it has that kind of allure of odd things happening around you. It's never boring. And um, yeah, it's just something that compared to other cycling disciplines just seems to just seems to hook you then uh, gives people you know a lot to talk about
Now, what do you believe to be the history of Cross? I know next to nothing about the history of Cross. So I think the, uh, the origins of Cross are probably lost in the mists of time, which I think is quite a nice, nice story. I quite like the fact there's no definitive answer to who organised the first race or who the first rider was. Um, a guy called Daniel Gusso, who was a, uh, a private in the French army that used to uh, run around after his general who was on horseback in the woods in the 19th century and uh, ended up deciding to follow him by bike instead and uh, then ended up racing his mates around the woods. I quite like that story, so I'm sticking with that one. Whether it's true or not, I'm not sure. I'm sure there's a bit of artistic license in there, but uh, I think the general consensus is that France was probably where it kicked off as far as organised racing goes. You know, I'm, I'm going with France if I have to give a, an opinion and uh, account of where it all kicked off. Gio Lefebvre, co-founder of the Tour de France, he described cyclocross. Imagine a cyclist in a time of war who is forced not to make do with the main roads, but to ride or trot across farmland, weave through the undergrowth and cross ditches. There you have the principle of cyclocross. The very early cross-country races that Guzzo and his friends used to do were basically from one village to another village to another village and they used to use spires of the churches, hence steeplechase, to navigate from one village to another village. And they used to race in a straight line, so they'd race across fields, over walls, gates, through woods. And this was basically the sport. And uh, they, they did races from, not races, but they, they would do training rides from uh, one city to another, all, all, all the way in the field. And then some, some guys were good at it, and then they started up races like that. And that, that was in the beginning in the Flanders of, uh, of cyclocross. There were no, no, no laps, there were no circuits. It was from one city to another city, and that was it. French Championship in 1902 was the first major race. Um, and back then it was called uh, Cross Cyclo Pedestra, and it wasn't called Cyclocross until the 1930s. So these early cyclocross championships, uh, the first Belgian championship was in 1910. Um, they're as old as, um, or older, than some of the classic uh, road races. You know, the first world championships were in France, in Paris, around Montmartre in 1950. Um, but even before that, there's this kind of good records of, of uh, Octave Lapice, who was a Tour de France winner in the early uh, 1911 or 1912, who you know, credited some of his success on the road to racing off-road in the wintertime. So cyclocross came before road? Well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that. <laughs> Are you hinting at that? Um, I'm saying it's as old as. Now, if I'm history, then he's prehistory because uh, he, he saw everything starting up. There, uh, at the beginning, there were only 10 or 11 cyclocrosses in, in a season, and that was it. And they, they, they were going to the cyclocross by train. Now we all have a camper and, and big things to, to, to stay in. He, he went, so he had to come back with his, with his bike full of dirt on the train again. So that, that, that was really a pioneer. I think it, it went through a phase where it was, it was big in Switzerland and then Belgium suddenly started producing some big name riders. Uh, probably, you know, they'd had the de Vlamink brothers and Eric de Vlamink was 
you know, through the 70s was the the cross five-time world champion and, you know, a big personality. And then his brother Roger was, you know, a great road rider that kind of just every now and again I'd get on a cross bike and, you know, win the worlds or win some big races. And, you know, I think that led to, like, Roland Liberton, who was probably the again another five-time world champion that came along at a time when Belgium was a little bit desperate for success in cross you know the Swiss had been ruling the roost a little bit and then Liberton came along and started winning worlds and I think his personality really really worked with the Belgian fans you know a bit of a playboy he drove a Porsche different girl on his arm at every race uh, you know he if he won, he'd go and close a nightclub and party all night. And, and I think the Belgian fans quite like that. He was something, he had, he, he had something to look at. So people was, was really excited by him. And that, that, that became the beginning. At the, at the period of the Vlaming, there were some flashes in the news. But uh, afterwards, it, 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 became, it became, yeah, it, 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 it was... He was something, somebody big. He, he even did Tour de France, so people went looking for him, and then also television and, and, and things get rolling. And that said, uh, yeah, he was really someone who started. Uh, he started up things. Well, when I when I was doing cyclocross at the beginning, it, it wasn't so big. It, it became big because we were lucky to get television on it. And then it became a success because uh, people are uh, at a Sunday, it's three o'clock in the afternoon, so they have nothing to do. And it's only one hour, so there's always a happening something. And, and, and so it, it came on, it came on. So now we have every weekend, every Saturday, every Sunday, we have a cyclocross on television. And that's, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And then I think once you've got the combination of interested television, very successful riders, you, you easily attract sponsorship and that's, that's not gone away. And I think it's provided, the sponsorship has provided the opportunity for Belgians to do it full time, make good money and where a lot of other countries are still treating it as a hobby and something they kind of try to do professionally but it, it's quite hard. The Belgians have, have kind of got it nailed as far as the television success, sponsorship continued development of riders. Cyclocross is, uh, is in the last 10 years changing so much. It's, uh, it's incredible. It's uh, the television, the crowd, the people, sponsors, uh, the bikes. They raced cyclocross uh, with different bikes. Uh, they need to run more uh, because uh, the tubes were not, uh, the tubulars were not uh, what they are now. Uh, the pedals, uh, we are riding with disc bikes. Uh, it's completely different. It's, it's, yeah. Every year is, there is every year something new. Um, every, every year there are new riders. There are riders that falling away. There are, it is again now a new, a new generation and it's, um, yeah, I think the sports uh, is, is not standing still, it's uh, going on and um, the future is, is yeah, just uh, great for us, for a sport. Well, I think um, the mecca of the sport still is Belgium. But uh, thanks to the television, uh, the internet, the, uh, because, because of that there are yeah, a lot of other countries that are uh, picking up things and um, starting to, to work with uh, young riders uh, to, be to become yeah, a professional rider or, or to become a, um, a big athlete like uh, like the athletes in Belgium and like yeah in, in, in the States it's already uh, growing great and uh, in all the other uh, European countries it's it's also growing uh, yeah every year is uh, it, there is there is something new and uh, it's still going on.
besetting tree problem. So, you're very heavily involved in the Rafa Cross. How, how did that all start about? Um, having raced cross for quite a few years and having been to uh, events in Belgium as a spectator and in the UK as a spectator and even to the States, the UK seemed to be lacking any, um, any razzmatazz. My thinking was bring it back to somewhere people can get to it, where we can get members of the public, not just cross fans, but get new people on board to see it, because people love bike racing in this country. You know, any bike racers that are on now are absolutely inundated. And if they know about cross, if they get to see it, if they get the chance to see it, they're going to love it as well, and they do. So uh, that was my thinking, just to do, to get a bit of, uh, get a bit of glamour and uh, pep it up. And uh, thankfully I went to uh, Simon at Rafa and um, he agreed and let me run with it, so we just went from there. Cyclocrossers do think really hard about their bikes. They, they'll worry about tyres, they'll discuss pr tyre pressures, whether to go tubs. You know, the cyclocross bike is a much talked, a much loved item of, of choice and style. But you get, you get out on your cross bike and it becomes visceral. I don't feel limited on a cross bike the way I do on a road bike. It um, just makes me smile. And that's what riding a bike should do. What makes a cyclocross bike? Um, uh, another, um, how you say it? Um, well, the geometry. There's not that much to it. It's, it's mostly a road bike fit with a little bit longer front center and a little bit shallower angle. So the cross bike is basically like a road bike, but with knobbly tyres. Slightly longer chain stays. It's not just a road bike that's been converted to be ridden off-road. This is it's a real thoroughbred race bike. When you're riding it off-road, you want to have kind of a good kind of head angle so that the bike's kind of predictable and good for through the turns, whether it's through the hairpin corners or through some of the single track that we see. The other thing is, also want to think about the bottom bracket height. So you want to be sitting in the bike, not kind of really perched up on it. But if, you, if the bottom brackets were too low, the cornering pedal would catch the ground and screw up the... the... Hey, before we go any further, I was just wondering, does this wall make my bike look fat? Because I'm a little bit worried that my bike is going to look fat against this wall, so... And there goes Pauline. If she carries on like that, I'm afraid the bicycle won't last very much longer. The thing about cross bikes is that they're kind of bikes that have an identity crisis because they're not really sure what they want to be. They're not sure if they want to be a road bike. They're not really sure if they want to be a mountain bike. Uh, they do a little bit of both. And you can see that they maybe are a little bit bipolar that way. Wait a moment. He. Um, to me, I guess a cyclocross bike is essentially kind of an all-arounder. The mud, snow, ice, slush, anything. You're bound to run into uh, in cyclocross. It's, it's kind of one of those bikes that'll just pretty, pretty much do anything, so. Yeah. That's what I have here and I'm pretty happy with it. And again now every major bike manufacturer has got a cross bike in the range and you know you've suddenly got the... Go away, this is my, this is my moment. Can you see me okay over the bike? Uh, I can perfectly now. Hi, I'm uh, James from Specialised. I'm Ben from Condor Cycles in London. My name's Chris Garrison and I'm the media maven for Trek UK which is really a made up title. I'm uh, Don Mason from Kinesis UK. I'm the designer for uh, the bike range, and this is um, one of our cyclocross bikes. It was absolutely great fun. <laughs> the one that got the muddiest one. Who was that? Charlotte. 
That's the thing about uh, cross bikes. They look comfortable muddy. They, they say, let's go do something. We had fun, let's do more. So big things that you've got to think is, um, when you're riding it off-road, you need a much greater amount of clearance that's built in between the frame and the forks. To let the mud come through, otherwise you get a big ball that's going to build up around the tyres, and particularly in this area around here, and down here by the bottom bracket. This is potentially a place for mud to sit. As you can see, you can pretty much fit your hand between the tyre and the frame. Gives us a lot more clearance. It allows for a lot more mud to pass through without clogging up the wheels. On a road bike, that would be much, much tighter. How long have you had that moustache? Uh... important feature about a um, cyclocross bike that you're going to race is that you're going to be running with it on your shoulder over obstacles and of some kind most of the time like hurdles or hills sometimes so it's no good if you've got a um, cable stops underneath the top tube here because it will dig into your shoulder so on our bikes we have shaped the top tube completely clean so when we shoulder it we don't have any cables rubbing on our, our body or kind of shoulder as we run with the bike and it also makes carrying the bike easier if you don't have uh, and the space within the frame is increased. And to give it a lot cleaner kind of look here. That's what we try to pay attention to. wheels turn out to be an interesting thing. You know, there isn't really big differences or any differences between a road wheel and a cross wheel. I mean, this wheel, you could rip the tubular off, put a road tubular on, and it would just be the same wheel. Tubs and super light carbon um, rims are probably the best thing going. They cost a, a lot, and tubs are real pain in the ass to deal with. So you, if you sign up for that, you got to be prepared to, to um, pay the cost of that. You can turn it up with carbon, you can turn it up with deep section wheels, but if, if the ground's going to get you... I mean, road wheels are generally alright for cross, it's just you've got to make sure you've got a strong wheel, and if the wheel's strong enough and built well enough, then it's fine for cross, you know, even if it's a road wheel. And so, I wouldn't say it's essential to have carbon wheels, it's nice to, you know, if, if someone wants to give you carbon wheels, or if you've got the money to buy them, then they are a little bit lighter, and a little bit more Okay, okay now, now I know it. You just have to pick what, what you can afford and what your preferences are in that regard. What do you think of those tyres? Yeah. They're getting the right tread, the right, the right tread for the right conditions, and the right pressure is massively important because grip is, grip is everything, really. What actually gives you grip, and, you know, obviously initially is the tread, but once the tread packs with mud, it's how it clears so it can then re you know, regain the grip. If the course is a little bit harder in places, or a little bit more tarmac, or a little bit more hard pack. Grass, sand, it can be icy some days. And so a different tread for different courses is, is essential. Most people who start, start cross probably want to start with a clincher because it's such an easy thing to do. So one of the other things with um, the jubler tires is if you're racing, if you're an event where you're racing on a Saturday and Sunday and you have a really bad day and you end up puncturing twice, and you haven't got a mechanic, then you're gonna have a late night trying to glue those two tubulars back onto the wheel and hoping that they they dry and they're set in time for the race the next day. So that's where kind of the clincher and the tubeless system is definitely gonna be a benefit for those privateer riders. Um, clinchers with tubes, you can use them, you just have to pump them up a little bit and riding a, a course at high pressure really changes the way things go sometimes. It's not always bad, it can be, can be fast, but it um, definitely has an effect. There you go. And then eventually, you switch to tubulars because everybody, everybody tells you it's like tubulars is the only way forward. And then when you do, 
you go, ah, now I see, now I see. Um, I'm used to it. The whole thing about tyres and tyre pressures, which seems to be the, the thing that everybody talks about and everyone loves the, the whole tyre pressure thing. And we're not going there in this film. Yeah, if you're a commuter and you want to basically be at the top of the general classification on your weekly commute, then a cross bike is definitely the way to go. Absolutely. We've got more gears than a fixie. More gears than a fixie, yep. It's also got these great things called brakes. Yeah, last year saw the start of it where a handful of um, predominantly SRAM athletes switched over to cable operated disc brakes. So traditionally a cyclocross bike has used a brake like this, which is called a canty brake. Um, they're used because they give you a lot of mug clearance because a traditional road caliper would just clog up almost instantly. Discs are now an accepted feature on, or almost expected on a cross bike now. Hydraulics, yeah, it's an option. People moving on to using the mountain bike hydraulic idea and just running it with a road lever. Which are these, you know, these new revolutionary things that allow you to actually stop the bike when you need to. It's got those. And there's a rider who's not very feeling very well by the look of him and it's doubtful whether he intends to continue. If you know how to work on hydraulic brakes, then it's all right. But if you don't want hydraulic brakes, you don't have to have them on this bike specifically. We have a variety of brake options. You could run a mechanical disc brake. What happened? Give us some time. Some tram or dog? I'm on That's a step up. If it weren't for the weight difference of a disc brake bike, I don't think there would be a question. We'd all be riding disc brakes now. The cantilever brakes are a relic. They work fine in dry conditions. They don't really work in wet conditions. And if both road and cross, um, I think they'll be gone soon. Um, but it's just that sort of clinging to existing technology and the people fighting for the last few grams of weight on a race bike um, that justifies that their existence and we'll find ways around that at some point to where there's no real weight difference and there'd be no reason to ride cantilever brakes. For me the cyclocross is a great leveler. I mean it doesn't matter if you're Sven Nice with all the best kit and all the best gear or you're Ian Field and you turn up at a race, you're still gonna get muddy. You still have to ride the same route, the same conditions and you at the end of it you're <laughs> it's very hard to be lofty and have keep your dignity when you're completely covered in mud. Just being in Belgium taught me so much in so many different aspects of the sport. It's it's the real deal over here and the courses and the competition just they either break you down or build you up. And the bottom line is just this is where the best in the world are, so you know, if you really want to get the full experience and learn how to race, this is where you should be. You know, I mean, to take an American sport like football, or American football, you don't go play football with the best quarterback in the NFL. But they're going to go play bicycles with the best cycle, you know, one of the best in the world. So it's just, I think that's, I think that's part of what makes it even more exciting and exceptional. Um, it's like it's crazy just coming from being one of the best in the US and coming here and just it's like everybody is at your level and above so it's just definitely a big learning experience and came here to race with the best in the world and hopefully to carry that over to some later races in the season.
like treat. It's like having pie. And then you get the best riders in the world and um, these just like terribly epic conditions, which again is something that we just don't see here. We just don't have the type of rainfall and the consistent mud and, and soil that you do in Belgium. And so I think that we idolize it a little bit. In my, in my view, we have two different things that are going on. We have cyclocross in the United States and we have cyclocross in Belgium and we'll probably end up somewhere in the middle as far as I can see the way things go on now. And compared to other countries, do you think that's the main reason that Belgium's are, are, are like the best cyclocross in the world? Yeah, because they have, they are, they are the best because they have the biggest history also. Now, now it's, 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 it became bigger and bigger and we, we always had the, the best riders. And, uh, and that's, that's why it's our, so a success now. I think cyclocross in Belgium is, uh, is big because everybody uh, in Belgium uh, can see all the riders every weekend and it's uh, something um, special because in one hour there can happen a lot. The weather is uh, decided uh, how the race course is. Uh, we have a few good riders on top of the UCI ranking and that all together, uh, that's why cyclocross is so hot in Belgium. Different uh, young guys are coming every season. Um, in the beginning, I was the youngest. I was uh, try to beat the older guys. Now I'm the oldest, and try to beat the young guys. So uh, uh, there are some new races that coming, like Milton Keynes this year. Uh, I do now for three years uh, Las Vegas race, and I want to promote my sport also. But most of all, uh, I like to do uh, the races and um, like to show my skills on the world to the world. Well, I think I was three years uh, when I started uh, to ride a small BMX bike. Uh, the first steps um, on something that uh, in a later stadium, uh, stadium was uh, my job. So uh, I was three years, and a small BMX was the, what the start of, was the start of uh, all of this. My name is Yu Takenochi. I'm 26 years old. Um, I'm already came in Belgium, like fifth season in this year, fifth, sixth. And you're the um, Japanese national champion, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. How many years have you been the national champion? Uh, already three times. From last three years, I was champion. Also this year, I will. <laughs> and how long have you been riding a bike? I think uh, from nine years old. Yeah, when I was uh, so small. I'm now I'm also small, but <laughs> much smaller than. I race because uh, my father said, "Oh, you should go race. And you have to." Go. But I was so nervous, and I just have. Have BMX, but uh, the regulation say no possible with BMX bike. So I borrowed from my friend, uh, no, from my bike shop, like old mountain bike, and it's like it looks so bad one. <laughs> and I race, but Eva has road bike, but uh, I was fourth or something. And my my father was pretty happy. So okay, you can do road racing, like you can do bicycle. I do uh, next year from next year like I w I won that race and yeah it's a start. <laughs> yeah, when I was 21 years old. Yeah, 21 years, 20. Yeah, 21 years old. My father was dead from cancer. Then I I think uh, yeah I start to talk my my mother 
Oh, I want to go. I think now he's happy. I hope so. Because <laughs> I'm in Europe. Yeah. It's pretty hard time in Belgium. It's, I'm alone in here. No friends. Yeah. But the Belgian fans like you, don't they? Yeah, it's, now it's <laughs> many people know my name. Now it's, I can believe it, it's awesome, <laughs> good, <laughs> I'm happy about that. Yeah, I'm very happy about that. So it's a really, it's a tough thing to do and I don't think people necessarily get the respect that they deserve for doing it. Um, it's tough in Belgium. Yeah, no shit. And that's the thing, it's that like, we've got this place in Belgium where we've said, okay, they've got these cobbles and they've got these, this experience. And it's just the two, they're just so much different that it's, you really have to immerse yourself if you want to do it. And yeah. It's a really, it's a really tough one because it's so hard for people like Jeremy to come over to, to Europe. Tell me about it. Two years ago I went there and it rained every single day. Do you know what that's like? Which is, which is kind of frustrating because, you know, it's a, it's a great place to race your bike. You know, if it wasn't good, we wouldn't be here. When I was a kid, my parents used to take me and my brother on cycling holidays and it was just fun. It was just a, a cheap holiday, basically. When I was 14, my brother decided that he wanted to start racing, so we joined a local cycling club and I had to do everything he did, so I started racing. I went to university to study physiotherapy and when you're doing physio, you have to do work placements through the summer, so you never get time to train really properly in the summer. So I stopped road racing and took up cross because you didn't have to train as long and my placements I could ride to, so um, I did that and I, was, I just got hooked because it was, it was so much fun and you could, you could do it on a short time. You didn't have to train for as long as you do on road racing and, and there's much less tactics involved and it's much more about riding as hard as you can and being as good as you can and technically you can gain a second and strength you can gain 10 seconds and it was much, I, I find it much more like the kind of racing where the best person on the day wins. Confidence on top of a, a no stress environment is, you know, it's a fantastic thing for an elite level athlete. So yeah, my job is to get Helen to race day with no stress and maximum confidence. Um, you know, and that means, you know, she, when she's not training, she's just got her feet up resting and recovering and you know, in the summer she can do all of the hard work for me, but when it's cross season, it's just about her and her getting the most out of it. I did my first cyclocross aged five. Um, it probably wasn't through choice. I think it was through being told I was going to race cyclocross. Uh, my father raced cross and, you know, and got me involved in the sport, so, I've been, I've been around cycling my whole life, I've been involved in cyclocross for 30 years and I've been helping Helen, uh, which is you know, pretty high level in cyclocross for the last 10 years. What, what are you doing with the bike? Why are you playing with the bike? I'm taking that wheel out so you can put it in there. It's huge over here, it's crazy. The other day I was coming back from the shops and the lady from the apartment the opposite started talking to me and said, oh, so you're a cyclocross rider? And I said, yeah, and she said, oh, have you ever ridden Koffenberg? And I so, said, yeah, won it a couple of times. She's like, wow, that's amazing. This like 90 year old woman. <laughs> it's just huge over here. They have, the world championships was in, um, in Coxider, so two or three years ago. They had 60,000 people at the event. They had half of Belgium's population watched it on TV. That's how big it is in Belgium. It's just ridiculous. It's just like 
huge, it's so huge and it's kind of like football is in England, it's the, the Belgians have their favourite riders, they come to the race, they support the race, they have all their jerseys and they have all their hats and all the rest of it to, to support the riders and it's just really big, it's just, which is, is good, it's exciting, it's exciting to be part of it, people want your autograph all the time, they know who you are and that kind of thing but because to me cyclocross is about the whole family environment, the friendliness, the the camaraderie, the, the way that you could just go to a race and have fun with other people and then race them and then still have fun with them afterwards. It, it, it's not really about that in Belgium, but if you want to be the best you can in your sport, it's, it's the best place to be because apart from two World Cups, every race was in, within a two hour drive of my house. It's, you know, you can't, you can't get that anywhere else. So. Want to win? Yeah. Ooh, about three million out of 12. <laughs> I'm excited, I'm excited. I love the race, it's a really good race for me. Every year everyone's a bit faster or you change your objective so you're not quite. This time last year I wanted, I knew I was on perfect form to win that and I really wanted to win the European Championship so. It was a bit different last year, but this year I won last weekend, so I'm obviously on good form. <laughs> and winning Koppenberg's awesome. I like that because it's big in Belgium and it makes you, it makes people know who you are, which is really good for for you, really good for your sponsors, really good for your, for how you get to races and getting contracts for races and things. It's like, that's quite important, but, and you get a cobble, which will probably be the only trophies that I keep from my entire career will be my cobbles. <laughs> They're very uh, symbolic of Belgium and hard Belgian races really, so. It's a big race, it, to Belgians it's probably second to a world championship win, you know. It's, it, Sven Nies has won it eight times and they love him and they, if he won Koppenberg on Friday and he never, won another race all season, they'd still love him because it's Koppenberg and, you know, it's such an epic, awesome race and it's so, it's everything that is good about cross in Belgium, you know, so to them it's, to, to a Belgian it's just a, a huge event. You, you can, they know who won the women's race and they don't always know who win the women when the races for the women in other races, so. You made it look easy. It was <laughs> Everyone respects the fact that it's a job here. There's group rides you can go on. There's um, people to train with. There's good tr training environments. There's it's a really respected job, and and that's a really good thing. And that's that's what Belgium is really about. You can when you go to the dentist and you say I'm a professional cyclocross rider. They say, oh yeah, what you know, what races have you done? Have you done this one? Have you done that one? Whereas in England, until recently, you'd go to the dentist and you say, I'm a professional cyclist, and they say, oh, okay, well, what do you do for your other job? Do you find everyone getting nervous in front of the camera? Yeah, they completely change. Yeah. What usually happens is that eventually you relax. I started cyclocross when I was 16 years old. It's just very casual. Just turned up at some races with one bike, 60 psi in my tyres, and um, fell off on every corner. Basically, I was just riding for myself. I didn't really know anyone in the sport. Um, I was so new to it, really.
kind of one thing led to another. I did my first World Cup and I was still not sponsored. And after that, that was kind of when I thought, well, maybe it'd be good to join a team. I applied to a few teams and then Beeline came back to me. My results were kind of getting better and better at Cyclocross. The sponsorship has progressed each year. Now uh, Vestalize came on board, Reynolds Wheels and Challenge Tyres. Uh, Lewis is helping massively. Mark Ake is my mechanic. See Ben, it's coming back. Oh, well done, mate. Beeline are a fairly small shop, really, just in Oxford. Uh, but their efforts in Cyclocross are pretty large now. I've got one ordered, but didn't arrive in time, yeah, so... Annoyingly, so... We've got copies on there, mate. So we've got a few more riders now. So we've got Emily Wadsworth. She's the um, mountain bike national champion. And she's been doing quite well at the cross as well. We've got Lewis King, and this is going to be his first year where he's focusing on cyclocross. And he's national mountain bike champion for veterans. And we've got Mercy, a Spanish girl. She came second at the National Trophy Series. It'll be interesting to see our beeline grow, because we've kind of come from no in cyclocross ranks at all to potentially being able to take four titles this year. My name is Ben Sumner, I'm 21 years old. I'm from Reading in England. Yeah, when I go to Belgium, it's different for sure. Um, you can find yourself like leading a national trophy race over here with the elite men. And then you go into a categorised under 23 race and you find yourself just like fighting for 30th place. It's a whole different world. Um, ben sort of came to us a little bit by accident. He was racing a lot of mountain bikes, and you know, me and Lewis, who uh, Lewis owns the shop, and me who looks after the race team, we we didn't really go to a lot of mountain bike races, and so we didn't really know a lot about Ben. And so we kind of heard about him from the guys who raced in our mountain bike team. and said that there's a young rider who's looking for a ride. His shop that he rides for has just closed down and needs some help. So it wasn't really with any kind of massive kind of thoughts or a project in mind that it came along, but. We kind of forced him into riding cross because we were into cross and we wanted a, a cross rider to, to go and support the races and so it turned out he was really good at cross which was a bonus. How would you describe how you feel when you're on your bike? Uh, depending on what day it is. Um, on a Monday I feel bad always, day after a race um, and then maybe midweek I've recovered, feel a bit, feel a bit better but now uh, it feels but well, if you've got stress and stuff, you roll out on the bike, you always come back feeling a lot more chilled. Um, it's one good way to get out of the washing up as well. When I train at home, I generally train alone. Um, do the occasional ride with, with other people. I quite like to get the hard work done on my own. Um, I would feel a bit hard if you come back from a four hour ride on your own, you know? I think training on my own is a de-stress, you know. Um, sometimes you don't want to be with people, it's just a, get, a getaway, you know. So 
the Wednesday night cross training. It, we just um, it's in Sutton Arena in London. We've got like so you got Dan Tullet, uh, he's the national champ on the road in cross. We've got uh, Steve James, he's the national champion on the mountain bike. Uh, there's loads of good guys. And they've got a coach there. Um, we start off. We have to we run four laps of the track. Um, and then we'll get, in, get on our bikes, do maybe 15 minutes of a warm-up. Then we do, the course is about a kilometre. We would do ready. probably eight start efforts, okay, full on. Everyone's, everything's like a race. It's almost more competitive than a race. Because uh, everyone's peers, you know. Pyramids, so we'd, depending if we've got a big race on the weekend, we'd up, do maybe up to five pyramids. So one, two, three, four, five, and then back down, four, three, two, one. And then you'd do uh, some other drill at the end, maybe. But yeah, it's just tough. It's, nice. it's probably the hardest session I do of the week. Um, it's over quickly, but it's grim, for sure. I'm quite an erratic rider. I don't like to just, I can't wait in the bunch all day like a roadie. So I think cyclocross suits me quite well. Um, yeah, there's just nowhere to hide. Nowhere to hide. The Three Peaks is the, the oddball that people still know about and talk about. And to me, it's still a cyclocross race. It absolutely is. It's a, you know, it's, a, it's a bike race that started, whatever it is now, 52 years ago, I think. Came about from John Rawnsley, the organiser, riding around the Three Peaks, which is a, a famous three mountains in uh, the Yorkshire Dales, uh, trying to cover them on his, on his road bike, effectively, or his touring bike. Well, it had been cycled by a 14-year-old schoolboy as a challenge ride. And then my cycling club decided to have a go. And then the year after, we launched the race and had that beautiful trophy, Carl's Trophy, given. And uh, it's gone on ever since, since 1961. And how many times did you race it? 45. Three Peaks is my absolute favourite race ever. Um, it is quite extraordinary, there's nothing else like it in the world. Uh, I know people who've been up there and done one and come finished it and said I'm never doing that again, that was the worst experience of my life. And there's others amongst us who do it and go that was the best thing I've ever done and um, I kind of fall into the latter category. And it's the, the appeal is um, <clears throat> hard to put your finger on. I mean, the first time I did it, I, was, I had a stinking cold, it was raining, I had all my clothes on, I, I, everything that possibly would put you off doing something like that. Um, was in alignment and yeah, I finished it and just thought, well, I've got to come back and do that again because it's fantastic.
why do you why do you want to come back and ride it? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Ask me that in a couple of weeks, and I'll say, yeah, it's great. I'll do it again. Yeah. <laughs> It's such an unusual event, you know, you've got a combination of road and these crazy steep climbs and technical descents on skinny wheels. There's nothing like that anywhere and this is, this is it, this is the one. The, the race starts, you've got a very fast five mile section of rolling road. Um, because it starts in a group, it's at usually top speed. You turn onto a small lane and then ride gradually through somebody's um, farm and then up the beginning of Ingleboro. Give all a big cheer when they get here! And before long, you're, it's too steep to ride anymore. And so you're on grass through a pasture, and then suddenly you're off and, and hiking up this hill. Or if your last name's Jeb, you're running up the hill away from everybody. It's a funny one to train for. Because when you go for the first time, you have this idea that you should do running and, uh, you know, lots of off the bike stuff. But the fact of the matter is, you're not running. The only person who's running is. Rob Jeb, who usually wins it, um, everybody else is just trudging. So you need to learn to trudge with a bike on your shoulder. Three peaks, it's, it is like, but like it's the hardest cyclocross race in the world. It's, it's 38 miles. It's changed a lot over the years. I mean, in the early days, there used to be loads of running and carrying. Why do you love this race so much? <laughs> uh, I used to do. Uh, just because it's so special, it's just so unique, isn't it? I mean, I, I like normal cyclocross as well, but this is just to go over this terrain on these bikes and uh, the atmosphere of all the people and everything, it's just fantastic. Then it kicks up really steeply and you're going up these stone steps to the, to the summit. There's a few places where it flattens out a bit, but basically you're just walking straight up the mountain until you get to the very top. trudging up and then when you get to the top um, it's a matter of how good your descending skills are, how much you're prepared to let the bike go and uh, how confident you are and uh, I love both elements of it. It's a fantastic day out, beautiful countryside, Not, you don't get to see much of it of course. But... It's a really fast um, muddy descent, not many rocks, not much to worry about other than um, trying to avoid going into a bog and going over the bars. Then you turn onto another road section, pavement. So what makes it so tough? It makes it tough because you're never actually on the right bike. Uh, going up the hills you wish you didn't have one, on the road you wish you had a road bike, and downhills you wish you had a mountain bike. So. It's always, it's always a compromise and uh, that's what makes it really tough. The downhills are equally as hard as the uphills. It's just your arms and your shoulders and hands. It's so bumpy on a rigid cyclocross bike with 35mm tyres, it's, uh, it's awful.
Peaks for me um, is it's an event that was here long before mountain bike existed. So it was taking a bike where people wouldn't really think you'd ever take a bike. So it's such a it, it's such a difficult thing to get your bike and your tyres and your equipment round the three peaks. More rolling pavement to the bottom of Warrenside, and from there the thing kicks up gradually. You can ride most of that, then it kicks up really steeply. You start a really crazy rocky descent. It gets rockier and rockier, and there's water bars that are made out of slate. It's just the perfect place to puncture as many times as you can manage it. You're tempted to look around because it's a beautiful place, but you can't because you're suffering by then. You get back on the road, um, another five miles ish, something like that, and you make a turn and you ride up Penny Ghent. You can ride up most of Penny Ghent, it's just a cobbly. Um, road. Uh, at some point it gets steep enough to where you can't ride anymore. and then you get to the top. Um, you turn around and you let go of the brakes as much as you can and race down to the bottom. And from the bottom of there, there's another short road section, not much elevation change. Basically, whatever you got left in your legs, you use it up there and get to the end. How was that then? One of the hardest ones, <laughs> just not as fit, getting older, that was tough. Get me in. You didn't have the big cap, did you? No, I'm just not as fit. Well, you're you're now 46 or something. <laughs> I trust you. Yeah. There was a guy who told me you were eight or nine minutes in front oh, of the penny gas. I had loads. I had loads. Well, that's why I didn't try and give you a time split at the time. I wasn't sure. I was obviously coming after you as well, so I was well, kind of no. like committed. I, know. I was a bit committed. I managed to make it all the way to the last hill before I punctured. But, uh. no, I think my calves are going to collapse in any second. Good fun. Good fun. Five seconds under uh, four hours. Now that's good. That's what you wanted, under four yeah. hours? It's kind of what I was hoping for, yeah. Well, in some respects, I, su I suppose it isn't a cyclocross race in so much as there is nothing else like it. Um, it's, um, it's something that, that I suppose if it were invented in the modern era, if it were invented this year, it would be called the Three Peaks Challenge, because people have to put the word challenge on the end of these things. Um, but it's not, it's very much a race. Uh, and you can get out of it what you want, not everybody's uh, aiming for the, for the podium. Some people are just aiming to get round, so I guess in that respect, it is a challenge. Um, and it, no, it, it, it doesn't bear any relation to, to any other cross race, but um, 
but it's still wonderful. John Rawnsley, who, who uh, organized every edition, I think, until last year. Just an just amazing man with, who set his own rules for what the race should be. Uh, it had to be a cross bike. The bars could only be a certain width. Tires could only be a certain width. Um, these are purely sort of arbitrary rules um, of his own invention that don't apply to any other type of racing. Well, I think it's all part of the appeal. Yeah, it's absolutely. Uh, it's definitely the fastest growing discipline of cycling for sure. And, So really special here. There's beer, there's food, there's you know kids have activities, there's kids races. Um, it's usually held in pretty pretty decent weather for most of the months. But uh, yeah, it's it is a reason that it's the, the quickest and fastest growing discipline for sure. see the same people every weekend and then and, and this racing here is a lot less pressure than, than it is in Belgium. I'm so glad I got fifth. My lucky number four. But I'm fine with fifth. You get like a good bond. You uh, hang out a lot so uh, yeah it's it's more fun. You travel with cars sometimes with a lot of people in the same car or like in the bus or something so it's interesting. Yeah. Of course, in Belgium you have a lot of people showing up, in the US it's less, but you have a lot of people racing and they stay to see the race, so you have like around a thousand people watching the race. And, uh, there's a lot of uh, live fees on the internet, so that's, they have a lot of broad people watching it. So. I must admit, in the US they're nuts about Belgium. Cyclocross so started in Belgium, so that's why US people are so crazy about it. Everything was has to do with ice in Belgium, yeah. This sport cut is really big in Belgium, so. Yeah, my girlfriend is Nicole Duke. She's an ex downhiller and uh, she retired a few years ago and she started racing again. And she's doing cycling more stuff. She's a former national champion. So we have a great life. We, we travel a lot for racing. We do a lot of uh, great adventure on mountain bikes and stuff like that. So we, we have a really blessed life. So I think there's every every age group there's a race here and then in Europe there's only like four, you have elite men, elite women and then and the under 23 maybe and that's about it so yeah. Oh crap. You're looking at somebody I never clipped in until a year ago. What would you like most about that? It hurts. It hurts and it makes you get way outside your box and it's a total blast. And you do things you never thought you could imagine that you could accomplish. Like 
you know, falling asleep at night, I'm thinking about the course, I'm like going through it in my head, the lines, the, the shifting, the braking, kind of just going through all of that. So when race day comes, I don't need to think about it anymore. Yeah, like that. Yeah, What's um, prep like before the race for you? Um, prep for me, I pretty much, the race morning is always the same no matter where I am or kind of uh, like what the race is. I do warm up on the rollers and then a pre-ride and come back, change in my kit and uh, finish the warm up and then go to the start. U.S. cross racing is very participant based whereas Europe is more people are going to pay to go and watch a race and they don't even ride bikes or race bikes. It'll never have that percentage of television viewers and people being household names like Belgians are because it's such a, a vast country with a huge population. I don't, just don't think it'll, it'll ever be, you know, it's not going to be baseball or basketball or American football. But there's no reason why the, the, the successful and the best American riders can't go to Europe and, uh, well, mix, mix racing in the US and come to Europe to do what are currently the biggest races and be successful. There's no reason why that can't happen at all. You know, there, there's, there's, there's no difference in the actual riders. It's just the, the ability of, or the willingness of some of those riders to take the plunge and to spend not just one season, but kind of a few seasons in Europe, racing week in, week out against the best guys in the world. But again, there's no reason why that needs to happen particularly because America has got its own style of racing and it's got its own pockets of very competitive and very popular racing. is weird and wonderful. What, what, you know, what makes people yeah. go nuts at cross races? I mean, it's that, it's that the reason that people freak out at cycle cross races is, is very, it's very much the atmosphere of it. It's, it's in the, it's in the fall, so it's usually cold. There's usually mud. There's usually alcohol. Um, there's usually great food like waffles or donuts or French fries and beer. And there's usually fire pits and hot tubs and people dressing up in bikinis, men mostly. <laughs> but I mean, there's, there's the idea of just being able, I think, to see a high level sporting event, but to be able to be so close to it, to be able to see and feel the sweat off of a competitor's face or a friend, um, that happens a lot. You see that, that the older riders, the, not the pros, but the, the people that are cheering their friends on. There's a lot of camaraderie and there's a, it's a day of it. I think that this, the really the, the path for American cycling, uh, at least to, to get into the sport, to be able to, to have fun with bike riding. What's the next plan? Where are you going next? What are you doing? Um, home for a week and then to Europe. Okay. Uh, represent that jersey best I can at the World Championships. Congratulations, sir. Have a great day. Thank you. It's going to be hard. Um, it's in Holland, so it's... Um, I know the course. I don't like the course, but it is what it is. <laughs> it's Hugaheide. It's one of those... It's like a field race course. Um, not not too technical, not too... Like, it's challenging if it's muddy, because it can be a heavy course, but it's not real technical. Thank you. 
Yeah, the World Champs is great. So that was my that was my first World Champs. Um, and it was, it was just a whole different world, you know. It's like being at a football game. Um, you were just treated like like royalty almost. You know, I've done 25 years in mountain bike racing where women have always, since mountain biking started, women have always been equal to the guys as far as the racing goes. They've always raced for the same time. Uh, you know, even now, you know, a World Cup or World Championships, exactly the same time for the men and the women. And at the, at the top, you know, World Championships, World Cups, prize money's always been equal. The, some of the other races, that hasn't been the case. But in the last couple of years, in mountain biking, it's become equal. So, where are we now? 2014, men's and women's prize money equal for all races. And, and cyclocross has come in a situation where women started racing the first World Championships in 2000. It kind of started out not on an equal footing, and it's been very, very hard, I think, for, for the women to, to fight for that equality in the discipline when it should never have started like that. It should have started as a, an equal discipline between the women and the men. You know, the disparity between the two has been quite alarming, I think, in the last decade. And it's only really been the last it's two or three years, probably, where there's enough people shouting about the, the disparity and the inequality that the change is happening. So we went with the 23, Great Britain team. It was me, Steve James, Adam Martin, Jack Clarkson. It used to be, oh, I want to be the first Brit today. So that's, that is your first aim. But now um, it's a team, team effort rather than just battling against each other, which is what I think you need when you're abroad. It's nice to have friends. If you're, if you're racing them week in, week out, it makes sense. It's Ian Field as well. He's slowly joined into the group. He's, he's an elite, so he needs to be a bit more sensible. If we want to move up as a nation, so I've crossed. We've got to help each other.
I'm really happy that we can uh, show the world what cyclocross is because it's something that, uh, that yeah, in every country you can do. Uh, weather circumstances changes everywhere. You don't need to have a big venue to have a nice uh, race course. Yeah, we need to, to promote the sport uh, that sponsors uh, are coming to, uh, to our discipline. We are more global sport right now than uh, 10 years ago. Sven nice, Sven nice.